Please sing with us, Open My Eyes. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and Jesus, God's Son, who dwelt among us. Blessed be God forever. Blessed be God forever. Water is so much a part of our lives that it is sometimes hard to see. It makes up roughly three-quarters of our bodies. We drink it in order to live. We use it to cook and wash. It falls in showers on rainy days and gathers in puddles. It fills our lakes and oceans, giving us horizons to gaze over and somewhere to float in boats. Water is so familiar to us. And yet, watery places are among the least familiar on our planet. The cool blue beneath the waves of our lakes is an unfamiliar world, inhabited by creatures who are comfortable there in a way that we are not. Oceans become even less familiar. Even the sunlit beauty of the coral reef is a world of creatures that can seem comical, ridiculous, or even dangerous. The depths become increasingly out of our experience, filled with creatures who look and behave nothing like us, whom we look upon with fear. Is our God the same? Does God live in a remote place? Do we put our God in a place so far away that we are uncomfortable there, so that we would have to change completely who we are in order to be there in the presence of God? Perhaps not grow gills or fins, but grow in perfection or beauty or goodness in order to survive in that God place 
that is so unfamiliar and strange. We forget sometimes that God, like water, is not in just some faraway place, but is as near to us as our own bodies, coursing through us like blood pumping through our veins, giving us life and purpose, not demanding impossible adaptations. God, like water, can be soaked in where we are now and can spring forth from our beings. God, like water, can propel us forward to be the helping hands needed in this world. Because God, like water, is nearer to us than we are to ourselves. We need not be afraid. Today we're invited to see ourselves in Luke's narrative about the father whose son returned home seeking reconciliation. And isn't that true of all of us as we've considered repentance during this Lenten season? And so we pray. God, you have created us out of love and you surround us with your loving embrace. We give thanks and praise to you for your good news which gives us the strength to reach out to others in love and in compassion. We gather in spirit today to remember our call to be in communion with each other, no matter what our differences may be. We ask you to humbly make up what is lacking in our faith, in our hope, in our love. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name in the unity of your Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Joshua. God said to Joshua, Today I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. While the Israelites were encamped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th of the month. On the day after the Passover, they ate of the produce of the land in the form of unleavened cakes and parched grain. On that same day after the Passover on which they ate of the produce of the land, the manna ceased. No longer was there manna for the Israelites who that year ate of the yield of the land of Canaan. The word of God. Thanks be to God. A proclamation of Psalm 130. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old order has passed away. 
Now all is new. All this has been done by God. We have been reconciled to God through Christ, and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. I mean that God, in Christ, was reconciling the word to God's own self, not counting our own transgressions, and that God has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. We implore you, in Christ's name, be reconciled to God. For our sakes, God made Jesus, who did not know sin, to be sin, so that in Christ we might become the very holiness of God. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. Please rise in body or spirit for the gospel. Glory to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Proclamation of the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax co collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes murmured, This one welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus addressed this parable to them. There was a man who had two children. The younger of them said to their father, Give me my share of the estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property. Some days later, the younger son gathered up his belongings and went off to a distant land where he squandered all his money and inheritance on loose living. After everything was spent, a great famine broke over the land and everyone, including the son, was in great need. So the son went to a landowner who sent him to a farm where he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat the husks that were fodder to the pigs, but no one made a move to give him anything. Coming to his senses at last, he said, How many hired hands at my father's house have more than enough to eat while I'm here starving? I will break away and return home and say, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called one of your children. Treat me like your hired hands. When that younger son soon set off for his home, and while still a long way off, his father caught sight of the returning child and was deeply moved. The father went out to meet him threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son began to speak, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called one of your children. The father said to one of the workers, Quick, bring out the finest robe and put it on this one. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Take the fatted calf and kill it. Let's celebrate, because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. This one was lost, and now he is found. The celebration began. Meanwhile, the older son was out on the land. Nearing the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing, and he called one of the workers and asked, 
what's the reason for this dancing and music? The worker answered, your brother's home and the fatted calf has been killed because your father has him back in good health. The son grew angry at this and he would not go in, but his father came out and began to plead with him. He said in reply, for years, I have slaved for you. I never disappointed one of your orders. I never disobeyed. Yet you never gave me such as a kid goat to celebrate with my friends. Then this other one returns after having gone through all your property with prostitutes and you kill a fatted calf for him? Then the father said, my loved one, you are with me always and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. This brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he's found. The good news of salvation. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The reflection that I'm about to offer was prepared by Sister Mary Ann Dixon. Sister Mary Ann had a bit of an accident and was not able to record the reflection, and so I am the messenger today. But she created the message. So thank you, Sister Mary Ann. Sin is being a wallflower on the edge of the new creation. Wow. Sin is being a wallflower on the edge of the new creation. That remark was made by Timothy Radcliffe, the former Master General of the Dominican Order. Let's unpack that. First, I want to clarify that this parable is not an allegory matching the father with God and the sons with this or that group. It's a story about reconciliation among members of the community. The gospel writers were preaching to those who were already doing the work of the church. The situation, the Jewish Christians who were suspicious of those Gentile converts were keeping score. Who had been Christians the longest? Why were they bypassing the Jewish laws on their way to following Jesus? What about us? We've been working for years. Can you hear some whining? Maybe some of you are experienced enough to recall a time when practicing Catholics would look down upon an errant person who had a deathbed conversion. I once had a conversation with a practicing Catholic, father of seven, who resented it because his children practiced birth control and still went to communion. Today, we'd probably be ecstatic if our kids were even going to church. Ah, the struggle about who's obeying the rules or about who's doing the work or who's following Pope Francis and who's up to date on scripture study and who's concerned about justice. The Gospels were written for us who show up and who are tuned in today. We are so often hardworking but noticing those whom we think are not doing enough or not seeing the urgency that we see. The older son, he missed the point that his father already loved him 
and had left two-thirds of his estate to him. He was slaving for rewards that were already his. His rigid self-righteousness in an effort to have his father notice him and give him credit turned him against his brother. Luke had already described the lost sheep and the lost coin, and now he was describing the lost son, and this up the ante. Now, it doesn't just involve property. It involves relationships. We think we're right. Every one of us. Otherwise, we're not authentic. So what do we do with the feeling we're right when it turns into righteousness? Think about your opponents or adversaries or the people that simply tick you off. Valerie Carr, who wrote See No Stranger, makes some suggestions. She's been involved with civil rights movements and justice work for decades, and she's had to work at nonviolent thinking and nonviolent interaction. She offers much on the subject, but my takeaway points are two. Number one, Try to realize that any opponent probably has hidden wounds. We all have hidden wounds that influence or even control our interactions. Do you want to be dismissed because of your hidden wounds? Of course not. Your adversary has hidden word wounds too. Thinking about that, can lead us to compassion for the other. It can relax our frustrations. It can make our prayer for them more authentic. It can ease our collaboration with them. A second thought, in thinking about our adversaries or our opponents, consider this. Think to yourself, this person evidences part of me that I don't yet know. That's harder. Actually, that lines up with good psychology, which says that the behavior of another that annoys me is actually a part of myself that I have repressed. So this gospel is about relationships. The relationship between the brothers as well as the father's love for both of them. Can we see that both brothers are wounded? One brother, thinking only about himself without considering his father, asks for his inheritance and took off and behaved like a spoiled child. The other brother nursed his resentment and missed the whole point that his father had already shown approval for him. He was calculating who got the most approval or attention or love. Sometimes I picture God as a kindergarten teacher watching five-year-olds on the playground, loving both the bully and the peacemaker, just observing, wishing there was less antagonism and more cooperation. Sin is being a wallflower on the edge of the new creation. The new creation invites us in. The new creation is a fresh way of looking at relationships with God, our known and our unknown universe, our galaxy, our planet, our playground. Relationships will either free our creativity or stifle it. Relationships will either bring us joy and energy or burden us with hostility. The father in this parable has embraced the errant son and invited the elder son into the new creation of homecoming and reconciliation. Where are we? Where am I? 
what inner work is asked of me? Take some time, some friendly time, and share a thought with one another. Let us pray. The response to our prayers is, God, hear our prayer. That we may honestly confess our judgments of others for the sake of healing my soul and my relationship with others, we pray. God, hear our prayer. That we may notice occasions of pettiness in our interactions with others, we pray. God, hear our prayer. For our deepest intentions and yearnings, those that we have not even yet discovered, we pray, God, hear our prayer. For leaders in our church, in our world community, that truth may be their ethical compass, leading us to justice and true freedom, we pray, God, hear our prayer. That optimism and expectancy may characterize our efforts toward ministry in the world. We pray, God, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God, our loving creator, we dwell in your abiding love. We pray that we may be ambassadors of your unconditional love and witness to hope in our troubled world. We make this prayer in Jesus' name with your Holy Spirit who dwells within us forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Most loving God, we thank you for our calling and for nurturing in each of us a disciple's heart, a heart that rejoices in your promptings, a heart sustained by your spirit, and a heart encouraged by the support and love of our sisters and brothers. God, you offer us new beginnings. Fill us with confidence in our work, and may our efforts extend beyond the threshold of our homes out through the servant's entrance to a world so desperately in need of hope and healing. Dream your dream in us, that in this house church your vision and direction will take shape in us and we will be transformed by your spirit. May your presence in what we do encourage us to dare and may solidarity and togetherness be our strength. We make this prayer in your name, with Jesus the Christ in your Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in our closing song, The Cross of Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. 